We'll continue this morning with our excursion into the parables of Christ uh, with two parables found in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the watchful servants and the parable of the fig tree. Uh, but I also thought that maybe today we'd start out with something uh, a little a little fun. Uh, because you see in, in the first parable, uh, Christ tells us that we should stay dressed for action, which is another way to say that you should you know, gird yourself up. And if any of you have, have seen a couple of times, and I'm actually hoping nobody has, uh, in my hall, but at the altar occasionally when I kneel and whatnot, it's a little awkward getting up because I just have yeah. a portion of, of, uh, of the uh, cloth there. And, and as I was reading the parable, I thought to myself, well, yes, you know, my, my all of this is actually a fair bit like uh, what uh, some of the uh, Israelites might have worn today. And, and Lord knows it is hard to get up and down with those things. I, I don't know how you ladies do it in the, in the long dresses. You all look so graceful. I look more like a bull in a china shop. So I thought it would be fun to go through and figure out how it is that, uh, that all of God's people and, and the ladies in the long dresses could, could gird their loins and be ready for action. Uh, so if you look on, on uh, this side of our handout today, courtesy of some rather witty and uh, inventive artists, we have the man's guide to how to gird your loins. And, uh, and as you see, you, you hoist up the tunic and, and you gather the extra material in the front and you swing it around to the back and you pull it around to the sides and tie it up and you're all good to go. I don't expect anyone will ever see my all in that fashion. Uh, if it is, you should probably run. <laughs> and so, on that note, uh, let's go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll begin with our, our parables today. And, uh, and the first comes to us uh, from Luke chapter 12, that's verses 35 through 48. And uh, I'd like to get a volunteer to read the, uh, the first paragraph there, which is uh, verses 35 through 40. So don't you all rush and raise your hands, uh, you know, in, in any sort of a highly anticipated or anxious way. Uh, but yes, there we go. We've got a winner in the back, if you would, please. 
and, uh, and there's a couple of, of points that we want to, uh, to really consider as, as we read this. Uh, so the first is stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And uh, to be dressed for action is, uh, it, it is actually quite similar to, uh, to girding up your loins, to be ready, uh, to be ready to do the work and the task at hand. Uh, this, is, this is the same kind of readiness that God's people were, were told to have as they ate the Passover meal in Egypt. You stand ready with your staff in your hand uh, to consume the food quickly. Uh, so this is, this is the, uh, it is warning to us that we, we must be ready. And by, by what do we, uh, do we connect this with, with this readiness? Um, and, and we will get to that soon. But the, 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 the point here is be ready and keep your lamps burning. And so, when we hear this word, keep your lamps burning, is there another parable that we've heard that involves uh, lamps that must be kept burning? Yes, yes. I have the same thought as well. I'm glad we're all agreeing. Uh, but yes, so, so these uh, virgins who were again awaiting the, uh, a kind of, of marriage feast. They were awaiting the bridegroom. And they were to keep their wicks trimmed and to have sufficient lamp oil because they again, like the master in this parable, did not know the hour of the arrival. And so when we hear this, keep your lamps burning, um, we can also think of what a lamp does and how we've talked in previous parables about uh, the lamp on the lampstand, that it is uh, to give us light and illumination. And of course, what kind of, of light uh, does the church celebrate and, and confess? It's Sunday, you know the answer. <laughs> That's right, Jesus, the light of the world. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so, so we are to Keep our lamps burning. And in this way we are to stand ready and to keep our, our light of faith uh, that uh, the word of Christ, uh, law and gospel, alive and burning and active and ready for the action in this world uh, because the Master is coming. Um, so so as, we, as we think of these, uh, of these things, uh, let us also think of ourselves, because that's truly what we're talking about. And then uh, there is a, a, a change in the language as we get into verse 36, uh, and then also in verse 37. And so 36 says, And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. But then verse 37 says, Blessed are those servants, who the master finds awake when he comes. And in the, in the Greek, we have um, the, the word for men, anthropois, uh, which can be really the collective of all people. But then in, in 37, as uh, at least the English Standard Version translates it as servants, uh, and uh, for those of you who know Dr. Norling at Concordia Theological Seminary, uh, and uh, he, he uh, is our Greek teacher, and uh, he is very emphatic that as we do our translations, we translate it according to the, uh, the understanding of the day of what this word was, that it was slaves. The slaves who are ready when the master comes home. And I think as we've, as we've talked before, slavery in, in the, the biblical times is not like the slavery of, um, of Egypt. United States uh, prior to uh, prior to the equality of all men and women. Uh, I think it, it's it's still a very wrong thing to take another human being as property and whatnot. So it's not a it's not a, an excuse to uh, practice a new kind of a kind of slavery in this world. But uh, slavery in the ancient world was, I think, maybe best described as uh, as someone with a green card in the United States. They are not a citizen, uh, so they do not have those rights and privileges. But they can purchase land and, and, 
you know, hold a job and accumulate wealth and, and act within the society much as, as the slaves of, of the ancient world did. And in fact, they themselves were often only slaves as well. Uh, so it's a tremendously long period here. Uh, but there is a, a sort of fundamental character. And, and I think that, um, I think it's not necessarily wrong for us to, to envision this word really as, as slave, because we're also told uh, that you and I, and that all the world, are slaves to one master or another. And that means you embrace it. Uh, before baptism, in our fallen state, we are slaves to sin. And indeed, our flesh remains bound in this kind of slavery to sin. So Paul talks about that his, his flesh does the thing that his spirit does not want to do. Uh, and, and his spirit desires to do the thing, but his flesh is always combating against him. So there is this, this slavery in this world to sin, that we cannot do a nothing good apart from Christ, uh, that, that is that is our bound condition uh, before baptism. And then in baptism, uh, we, we, we talk about the freedom of the Christian, but we also talk about, remember, that, uh, that the Christian in terms of the gospel is, uh, or in terms of the law, is free and uh, subject to none, but in terms of the law of the gospel, the Christian is a slave subject to all because it is the law of love that we love our neighbors as ourselves. And so even in baptism, as we are, are clothed with Christ and we are given freedom from the law, we are again, you know, bound to uh, to something else. We are bound to love. We are made slaves of the gospel. Um, and which is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing for us. Uh, because we have been set free from the law, but we still, uh, by the spirit that is within us, work to do the will of our Father, the work that has been given to us by the Holy Spirit, uh, to love our neighbors and to love our Father in heaven. And so there was a question. Yeah, I think it's important to note that at least the Jews, this is primarily debt servitude. As you can sell your family or yourselves into slavery in order to pay otherwise unpayable debt, almost a form of charity. Uh, thus, the whole seven-year people being treated as slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they had war captains as well. So yeah, they would have had that like as well. The 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 no, no, this is true. Yeah, this is true. Uh, if you look at the Greeks and the Romans, for them, slaves were uh, lower than lower than the Jews. Really did grant slaves much more in the way of rights and freedoms than most of the other ancient world did. But if you look at the slavery throughout the New Testament, it's, it's all uh, this is some sort of debt slavery. We're, we're slaves because of our debt, unpayable debt. Yeah, so we are sort of in a debt slavery anyhow, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's, that's why they used to say if you're slaves to God. Yeah. No way to be paid the debt. Amen. But that has been paid. <laughs> and I, I was reading uh, there was a practice whereby slaves could accumulate money at the temple. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, I think this is mostly the Roman slaves, but then the temple, after a while, when they had accumulated enough to pay their debt, the temple would buy them back from their masters and grant them their freedom. Oh, interesting. Uh, and that wasn't a gladiator, that's right. No. no. <laughs> that's where I got a lot of my knowledge. Okay. <laughs> so it is kind of fun to watch, but please do. So the, uh, there, there were mechanisms by which a, a slave could... Could win their freedom, yes. And, and, uh, and then there is even a, a level beyond that that, uh, uh, as Paul had in citizenship, the Roman Empire, which is even uh, a step beyond that from a slave to a free to a citizen. Yeah. There's, there's always a way in the political world to, to get what you need to get here. Especially in Rome. There's always somebody, you know, right? But yes, no, it's a very, very good. Uh, but I, I thought that it was important that, uh, that at first, in, in verse 36, it really is a declaration to, to all people 
of Slater Free, be like those who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. And why is it uh, that, uh, that they would be uh, so out of the know as to when the master was going to come back from this wedding feast? Uh, perhaps living around here with the traffic that it is, you might have an inkling of that knowledge. If a relative of yours goes off to a wedding feast, you know, and they might say that it ends at 9, it might be 11 by the time they get through traffic, right, to get home. But a uh, wedding feast in the ancient world would go on for, for days. Uh, and so the servants really had, had no idea when the master would finally arrive home. Uh, it might have been a rip-roaring great wedding, and then, you know, he'd stay there the whole three or four days. Uh, you know, maybe go to the after party, and so who knows when he'd come back. Or maybe it was a real snoozer, and he'd come back after one day. Uh, but there was, there was no accounting for uh, when the master would return. But they did know that he would return. And, uh, and so the first example here is of those servants who had been faithful to the master's will, had been ready and waiting for him to open the door at once when he first comes home. And, uh, and, and we can envision that also, the, the master coming home from a, 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 a rip-roaring, great wedding. He comes back, finds his servants, you know, ready and anxious and waiting for him to arrive. And what is it that it says he does? Uh, Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service, which is the same word he was dressed for action. So he will dress himself for service, have them recline at the table. So he'll say, you all sit at the banquet table, relax, and and he will come and serve them himself. Uh, so he's in such a great mood that these faithful servants get the night off, not only a night off to do whatever they want, but the night off to have the master come to serve them. And we also then, hearing this, uh, think of another master who came to serve and not be served, that master would be that's a good Sunday, the answer is always Jesus. Especially, and, and, and of course, you know, Peter was uh, was against by this and would not have, have our Lord wash his feet. Uh, but, uh, but Christ was insistent that he came to serve and not be served. That he must serve us. And so uh, that is the sort of great role reversal uh, that, that we see in our parable here, that here is the, the great Lord Master who is to be feared, who is to be loved, who has come home and dressed himself for action to serve his faithful servants. But then, of course, we flip the other side of the coin with the servants who have not been ready at the second watch or the third watch, uh, which would have, I think, been the, about 8 to midnight, midnight to 4 a.m., uh, somewhere in that range. Um, so at any rate, at a later hour, a time when one might not be expected to come home, and uh, and uh, if the how if the master comes to the house, uh, well actually I'm not getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Um, you know, blessed are those who are awake when he comes in those midnight hours. Uh, but then we also have what is a very sort of uh, logical, you know, proper statement. If the master had known when the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. If we knew when that bad thing was to happen, we would be ready for it. If we had that foreknowledge, uh, we, we wouldn't get away from home. We would stand ready to, to face and confront the thief. Uh, but, uh, but what it says is, but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour, the thief was coming, and that's you know sort of that, that opportune and appointed time. It's not a, it's not an hour as in like a specific time during the day, like you know the, the chronophon, the the time of, uh, of you know, minutes and seconds, but that 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 moment, that uh, that that sort of opportunity, that time, um, in that sense, uh, when the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into, and this is the same. Uh, time, the same aura or hour uh, that uh, uh, that Christ uses in his first miracle. Same sort of words, that same sort of idea. And of course, uh, that's 
the wedding in Canaan, and uh, and uh, the, the Virgin Mary comes to Christ and says, "They're out of wine." And uh, and what is Christ's response right away? He says, "What's it to be to you, woman?" Uh, not necessarily as disrespectfully as our 21st century ears might hear, but it is obtuse. It's not really an answer to the the, the, you know, the, the questions she's coming to ask. Uh, but when he says that my hour has not yet come, that opportune time has not yet come. Um, and, and so uh, as we're reading this, uh, another connection that our hearers would have heard with the hour that the thief was coming, the hour of our Lord that was not yet there in Canaan. Um, but again, we have that connection back to a wedding feast, a connection back to uh, Christ as the bridegroom, or as at the wedding in Cana, Christ as, as the host, really, the host of this joyous wedding feast, for he was the one who turned the water into wine, and then, of course, you know, everyone commended, oh, hey, you, you serve uh, you serve the good wine to all these drunk people that can't appreciate it. Uh, but Christ provides the very best gifts. I always did chuckle at that with the wedding at Cana because, you know, you always serve the really good stuff first and then you can you know, slop into the second and third tier wines. But Christ gives the very, very best. Uh, it's really in his nature to give his very, very best. Uh, but as, as this host of, of the wedding feast, um, as well as as, uh, as the bridegroom for whom the virgins wait, and also uh, the bridegroom of the church. Uh, that uh, this that, uh, wedding imagery uh, is so rich with our Lord. And so uh, the, the verse 4 there then concludes, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour do not expect that, that opportune time that they that they don't expect. Uh, and really, truly, we can think of it again as another time that we do not know or expect. Again, this admonishment to be ready. Um, I, I remember watching uh, Parks and Recreation. I can't remember what episode it was, but it closes. Uh, and, and part of the reason I remember it is they talk about May 20th, which happens to be my birthday. For any of you who are, are planning for doing birthday shopping. I'm kidding. Uh, but at the end of the episode, there's a there's a, a, a local man from Pawnee who's, who's in there meeting with Leslie and reserving a park, uh, you know, because it's going to be the end of the world um, on May 20th. And she says, oh, May 20th, we have a council meeting and a couple other things. And he, and he looks down, oh, no, I, I miscalculated the, the 21st. Uh, and she says, oh, the 21st is clear. Okay, that's the end of the world, you know. So they, it on the calendar, but no one knows this time or hour. Uh, and of course, you know, it's, it's fun to it's fun to poke fun of those who who, who do all these these uh, tremendous mathematic machinations and say that I know I know when this happens. Uh, yeah. So is that a warning about the second coming, transferring to that, or for our own for our own hour? Your own hour? Yeah. Um, you know, I I I don't think that it necessarily needs to be divorced from either me in this case. Um, uh, for ourselves, it probably actually is, uh, well, really, since no one knows the time, I wouldn't even say that for ourselves we should be warming for our own hour. Because, uh, who knows, it might be in the middle of the divine service today uh, that, that, uh, that Christ comes back. Uh, which would be a great place to be, I, I would think. Um, but, uh, but yes, to be ready for our own hour, to, to keep that, uh, that light of faith, that lamp burning within ourselves, um, to, to feed it with the lamp oil and fuel of, of the sacraments of the Word and, uh, and, and uh, being served by, by God in church. Um, those, are, those are very, those, those are the methods by which we keep that lamp burning. And yes, I, I think, uh, at least for, for those of us more practically minded, um, that like to plan our days, uh, it's probably better for us to think, you know, in our human terms of being ready for our own hour. Uh, but, uh, but also, certainly be ready for the hour, uh, capital T, uh, uh, of, of Christ.
Christ's return. Uh, so then, then you know, Peter comes and he sort of asks a, a similar question, actually, to that. He says, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everybody around here? Um, and I think that really is a, a demarcation in the parable uh, that the parable of the watchful servants I would argue it really is for everyone. Uh, but this next parable, while applying to all of us, you know, the royal priesthood, uh, I think it applies uh, uh, most firmly uh, to those in the ministry. Um, those who are you know, called to uh, preach the word and minister the sacraments. And as we walk through, I'll, I'll present to you my arguments for that. Uh, so then, you know, Christ replies, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Um, and so, this is, this is sort of the foundation of, of what I've seen, that who is the master set over his household, who is... Who has he put in place as an under shepherd to care for the sheep of uh, those who are, who are in the ministry uh, to give them their portion of food at the proper time uh, to preach to them um, God's law and God's gospel to administer the sacraments the food, the faith, the forgiveness of sins at the proper time and in the proper way um, and, and I would say that that is, uh, that is certainly uh, a description of the role of your pastor in the church. And uh, and so again, blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Uh, it doesn't need to be exclusively the clergy here that we're talking about. Because we also, in our own vocations, have been sent over a household to care for. Uh, we know and, and see this expressly in our mothers and fathers who have been sent over us as children uh, to give us our portion of food, and, you know, tangible food at the proper time, but also because uh, the, the faith uh, that, is, that is taught in the church and taught in our school here is, is taught in the home and is the responsibility of the parents uh, to pass on the faith and to teach the faith to our children. So this is also very applicable uh, to, to each of us in our own locations, or even those who, who don't have children. It's not that I can, I can teach Mr. Chan, my cat, uh, that to be a good Christian. Uh, there's just one sort of thing missing with him, and that would be the soul. But uh, he does have quite a will. I will give him that. He's had a very, very angry will. Uh, but uh, in, in, in just our, our standard vocations as Christians, uh, to care for our neighbors, to care for our brothers and sisters, and to uh, to provide all that they need for for you know body to build them up. Um, and, you know, as we follow the Ten Commandments, uh, we also to give them you know, food at a proper time. So it's really applicable to all. Uh, but I think it's a very firm and firm uh, uh, declaration that uh, that he's given to Peter and the disciples, uh, who will form the basis of his church on earth. Uh, and, and which is the church that we have today. And so blessed is that servant who does these things. Uh, and, and for the faithful servant, the one who is watchful and attentive, who does the will of the master, truly I say to you, he says, he will set him over all his possessions. Uh, but then here we have, again, a, a recognition of our fallen nature. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming. And begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk. If the one who is in this position, who has been set over a household, says to himself and succumbs to those sinful voices of the old Adam, Oh, the master's not coming back right now. I can relax and let back a little bit. Uh, I will abuse my power and authority. I will you know, beat the male and female servants. And I will eat more than my share. And I will drink more than my share and get drunk. And I will you know, use my power to satisfy my flesh. 
then the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect, as this servant is grown slothful and self-focused, completely turned away from the master and the master's will. And when the master does come at that hour that he does not know, he will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And actually, I think, uh, I think Barb, when you read it for us, you had a slightly different translation. Could you read us again uh, from, uh, I believe it's verse 46. The master of that servant will come on the day when he is not looking for it, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two, and appoint him with the unbelievers. And appoint his portion with the unbelievers. Um, it really is a, a, a visual of, of the eschaton. To, to slice him into pieces, uh, the most severe punishment possible, and to cast him out. A broken uh, and, and killed man with the unfaithful, with the unbelievers. Um, and it's, the, it's, the, it's certainly the most dreadful punishment um, that I think we can imagine. I think that's really the point of this really uh, horrific visual is that this is a, a, an eternal lasting punishment. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his master's will, will receive a severe beating. If you know better, if you know better and you choose not to do it, if you succumb to the flesh and you just do what it is that you want to do, and ignore the master's will, ignore the, the trust that has been placed in you in your vocation, uh, you will receive a severe beating. This is not a uh, uh, beating unto death, cut into pieces and thrown out of the unfaithful, but a severe beating. Uh, this is uh, probably tantamount to uh, Saul and getting knocked square off his horse and landing on the ground. Uh, you know, you're getting it knocked down. A severe beating. Uh, that, uh, that because you knew better. You knew better and you chose not to act. Uh, but then, of course, the one who did not know and yet still did what was deserving of a beating, to not do the will of the act, will receive a light beating. So even those who are ignorant of the faith uh, will, will receive a punishment. Those who are, are ignorant of the Ten Commandments, the, the poorly catechized Christian uh, who, who holds to the you know, faith in Christ, who's been baptized, who's clothed with Christ, who's a, you know, a slave of the gospel, um, they would, they would still be deserving of, of punishment. Um, but there is a, a, a lessening of, of this punishment because, because they did not know better and it still acted improperly. Uh, now this is certainly not to talk about eschatology in the sense of, of uh, you know, we, 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 we need to know better and, and, and hope for only a light beating uh, because the the, uh, the truth is that Christ has atoned for all of our sins, those willful ones and those unwillful ones, the ones that we know we've committed, the ones we don't know we've committed. Uh, he has atoned for those. We're not speaking in the end times in the eternal sense, but we are speaking in a worldly sense. Uh, if, uh, if someone as an adult knowingly takes money, and, you know, steals steals from their employer, uh, uh, they, will, they will certainly incur punishment in our, in our temporal world. If, uh, if one unknowingly uh, engages in the, uh, you know, insider trading, you didn't know that the tip that Joe gave you was a bad thing, and so you went ahead and bought those stocks. You didn't, you didn't actually know it was wrong. It's still wrong. You'll still receive that sort of temporal punishment, but there is a leniency given to that. Uh, and so we're, we're still talking about sort of temporal uh, in this world, in the church, uh, to, that, uh, that we are to, uh, in our dealings with each other, still speak the law, and speak the law in love. Uh, but those who do not know better still need to be admonished, but not as severely as those who, who willfully act against, uh, against what it is they have known, what they have been taught, what they have confessed. Uh, that, uh, there is the uh, uh, 
the, the practice in the church to, to think of a parallel possibly uh, in terms of excommunication. Those who are willfully unrepentant. I mean, it is the last resort of the church to try to win the brother back. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly severe thing, but it is for those who willfully and willfully are unrepentant. Uh, and that's certainly not a, a, uh, an action that we take against those who, who unknowingly sin and then repent. Uh, so there's, uh, and there's you know, grace and forgiveness available uh, in, in both of these cases. And the desire in both places is to win them back, uh, to make them whole, to bring them back into a church and uh, into a you know, right relationship amongst faith. And then, of course, we close this with um, everyone that, to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And then, of course, a uh, sort of parallel. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand of the more. And so, again, of those whom much is given, much is required. But to them, those who have been entrusted with much, there will be much more demanded from them, um, or, or, or much more to be asked from them. And again, I, I see a, a sort of parallel with, um, with you know, uh, all of the faithful, and then the clergy here as well, that we've all been given much. We have been given, like the term, that it is the, the most fabulous, amazing thing uh, that, that really our simple mind can't wrap its head around. Uh, that, that even though we die and we are buried in the earth, that body is going to come up out of the earth, made perfect, our soul will be joined to it, and we will live forever uh, in absolute perfection. Uh, and so that is, we have been given much. We have been given really everything. And we will be required much. Uh, required to uh, to daily crucify the old Adam, to, to daily drown him in the waters of baptism, uh, and to strive for the prize uh, by the grace that, that God has given to us. Uh, but to those who have been entrusted much, uh, entrusted with uh, the gospel, entrusted with the sacraments, entrusted with the care of the flock, even more will be demanded, not even required, but demanded. Um, of, of those, um, that there is a significantly uh, increased level of, to, to use a human term, and, and don't take this as, as doctrine, but there's an increased level of accountability. Um, the, a pastor uh, who um, is, is, is responsible for the flock, much like a captain of a ship, uh, every Every sin that, that we commit, every sin that, that happens in the flock um, is, is felt within the, the heart of the pastor. Every, every ache that you feel, uh, because you are, you are the flock, you are the children uh, that, that have been entrusted to the uh, pastor in his office. Uh, that as much as any parent uh, wants to avoid any pain, uh, but we also know better that pain will come and, and, and come upon us. Um, but, you know, there's not only felt responsibility, um, but if, for instance, in, in, uh, in communing and unrepentant, um, I believe it's actually in, in Luther's works, he talks about uh, you participating in the sin of the one who you, commu who you have communed, uh, who is in unrepentant sin. So there's really a, a very uh, marked difference with that, that sort of demanded uh, requirement of those in the clergy. Chaplain, you're here, you're here perhaps. Is there a thought that, that you have? It's a very difficult passage. It is. Uh, it, it, it seems um, uh, the, the challenge is not the confusion of a lot of gospels, but more the confusion of a lot of gospels. And, that, and that's the hard part to parse through. Um, Still not sure of the context that our Lord is giving us. Is this eschatological or is it not? I believe it is. Mm -hmm. I believe it is eschatological. I, I, I believe, and so everything has to be.
interpreted within that context in ways. It's interesting, though, that Peter's question is, um, is are you telling us about us or are you telling us about others? Uh, and that almost seems to be a question of duty, similar to the one um, but that the lawyer asked. And so, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> You know, let's parse this out because I, I need to kind of measure, you know, what my duty is. How nice I have to be Monday through Friday or if I can right, right. <laughs> something. Yeah. Is, it, is this about us or is this about somebody else? Because if it's about somebody else, then I'm off the hook and it's all okay. Amen. But if it's about us, I know, man, then I have duty. But then, on the other hand, our Lord kind of never really answers that. But he, well, but he does because he answers it in the same way he answered the to the question of who is my neighbor, he says, well, he acts neighborly. And in this question, he almost, his answer to is, who acts like a servant of the Lord? What is, what is being a servant? It's not about your duty, because you have been given much. There is nothing really that you can do to earn your salvation. And so out of that relationship, what do you do? How do you, where is your fruit? It's not a requirement, it is just who you are. It's, it's, it's an outgrowth. And so he kind of turns it back in, in, a, in, a, in a gospel sense. He's saying, just be in the church. Allow the gifts to emerge as you have been given. To the one much who's been given, much will be required. I would be really interested in what the Greek says in terms of requirement. Is it a duty question or is it a harvest? Is it the same question that he asked him? Is it tied to the parable of the fruit? Amen. Amen. In fact, when you spoke of fruit, I was thinking it's a beautiful segue. So thank you, Jim. <laughs> so let us turn then to our our our, uh, our other parable that. Uh, that has been presented in the same context here uh, in, in, in Caitlin's book, uh, the parable of the fig tree. So we'll turn to Luke 13, 6 through 9. Um, and in, in, uh, in an effort to be expedient, I shall read it to you. How's that? Uh, so it, uh, our text reads, And he told of this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. And uh, and so as we begin with, it, it may strike us as somewhat odd. There's a fig tree in a in a vineyard, um, but uh, some positive that uh, that the very reason it's sort of unique is because this was. This is sort of a pet project of, of the owner of the vineyard. This was, you know, this was his fig tree that he'd made for his own his own enjoyment, his own pleasure. Uh, you know, the, the bulk of the work there was was uh, was the vineyard, but you know, he had this this special fig tree uh, that was sort of his own thing. Uh, take that for what it's worth. I don't know that the text leads us in one direction or another, um, but uh, but as we as we sort of think of this. Um, you know, he says to the vine dressers, who's gardener who's taking care of all this work? You know, I've been coming to this this fig tree for three years, and I've been wanting a fig, and uh, there is nothing on it. It has produced no fruit at all, uh, and so it it, uh, it seems it seems useless. It seems a complete lost cause, um, and so you know, why should it be using up the ground? Why should it be using up and and inhibiting other things from growing. Uh, and so the divine dresser then sort of uh, combatively with the, with the master in a sense, or at least 
uh, with a greater sense of leniency. So a certain level of alone this year until I can work on it, until I can dig around it, uh, you know, upset its roots, uh, and, and inject some manure in there, inject some good, deep nutrients into it. And then, and then we'll see if the fruits will spring forth from the tree. Uh, and if it doesn't happen, then yes, let us proceed with your course of action. Um, and so if you might recall, we talked about uh, this word, Ephesus, uh, several times. And we look back then also to uh, the uh, parable of the weeds and the tares, where uh, the, the master in charge of the land says, you know, let the weeds be, let it be uh, until the harvest time. And then we'll, we'll cut everything out, sort it out. If the, same, if the same word used here where the vine dresser says, Sir, let it alone, or basis this year also. So forgive it for its lack of fruit. Uh, but give me time to work with it. Give me time to upset its roots. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, in this case, we, we can see the, the Lord of the vineyard uh, as, as, as our Father in heaven who has created all these things continues to maintain them, uh, you know, brings the rains to, to fall, um, and cares for all of his creation. And uh, in the context of, 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 uh, of Christ's parable here, uh, the fig tree, you know, sort of this, this, uh, this sort of pet project, if you will, um, is much like you know, the, uh, the unbelieving uh, people in in his chosen people, the folks who have who have been cared for, who are in his vineyard, in his in his world of salvation, but they're not producing this fruit. Uh, they're, they're not uh, they're, they're not fulfilling what uh, what purpose it is that they are created for. And uh, and so our you know, the Lord says, enough. Let's chop it down. Let's let's uh, bring forth something that is fruitful. Uh, from this, and uh, and vine dresser uh, is a, probably an imperfect analogy, but I know it. Do we not see Christ in the vine dresser, uh, who says, you know, let it alone, let it be, uh, you know, forgive it and give it time. I will dig around its roots. I will upset its very foundation of life. I will, you know, sever it from this earthly fallen world, and I will give it manure. Really, uh, uh, it's, I think it's an appropriate phrase because you know, there's a lot of things in this world that help to, uh, that help to strengthen our faith. And many times it is those, those trials that we go through, the fire that, uh, that the, the Christian is subjected to, uh, to purify, to take out the dross, to refine the gold that our Lord sees in us. Uh, so when the world heaps a load of manure on you, quite literally, uh, those days when you are tried and those days when you go through many great and deep trials, um, you know, it's much like the, the vine dresser who is shaking up your world, digging and messing around with your roots and, and, and injecting you with good nutrients uh, that, uh, that are probably rather sticky and things we'd like to avoid, but good nutrients uh, to foster growth and development that, by these things, we may bear fruit. Um, and again, it's, uh, as, as, as Chad was saying, very important to delineate uh, the difference between you know, the law and gospel as well as, as you know, our, our work and our salvation in this sense. And so the fruits here are, are uh, as with all fruits, a natural product of what it is we are tempted for. We are created to receive God's blessings. That is that the whole point of our creation. And then we are intended in our very way that we are made uh, to bear the fruits of repentance, to, to in our Christian baptism, in the faith given to us, and then nurtured by, uh, by the word and the sacraments, we can do nothing other than to grow and manifest.
manifest these fruits of righteousness in our Christian vocation, our Christian life. Uh, but that's not then saying that one can force themselves to create this good fruit and and stay at the uh, stay at the, uh, the the cutting of the tree. Uh, the, the, the fruits that we talk about in the church, the fruits of repentance, or what we say are good works, do not lead us to faith. Uh, rather, faith is what compels us and leads us inexplicably to bear good fruit. Fruit according to the gifts that we've been given. Uh, not all of us bear the same kind of fruit. Uh, we have different gifts, different talents. Uh, and so how are those, those fruits of righteousness? Uh, from from being uprooted with Christ and, 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 uh, and given our, uh, our nutrients by the gardener, uh, manifest in different ways. Uh, but then some trees resist these nutrients and resist uh, the bearing of fruit, at which point they also shall be cut down. Gentle? I was going to say it's interesting to note that the people who knew these and gave us very long were his pet project is you know his chosen people, his chosen people to carry forth the, the salvation. Amen. So what is the super thing you want to say? Faith is the beautiful fruit that Jesus is looking for and the and the the, the manure is the repentance. He's asking in that context that he's the worst sinner because it's not much good for him. So yeah. yeah, but that's what makes this fun. All right. Thank you, everyone, very much. We'll uh, we'll close here briefly with prayer, and then we'll proceed out on four different sermons. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed to us your Word, which is our salvation in this world atoning sacrifice of your Son upon the cross, that all who believe on his name will not perish, but have life eternal. We ask that you defend us this day and the rest of this week as we go about our locations in this world, and we eagerly await your word and your strengthening sacrament in your divine service today, and you have made yourself ready that we may recline the table and you serve us. In Jesus' name we pray.